Hey everyone, as promised in our daily financial news, I have a second extra special guest to the show, Melissa Johnson. How you doing, Melissa? I'm good. Oh, I'm good. I look like it. It's Friday. I feel good. <laughs> that is awesome. I am so excited for this episode. Uh, you, you have done, are doing, and will do some amazing things. So we're going to kind of break it down that way. The first thing I saw in your story is, yeah, you're the only person I know, and I know lots of people in the real estate space that have flipped a thousand homes and raised five kids while doing it. So shout out mom power, shout out to uh, all the ladies out there. Uh, I, I have no idea how you do that. I mean, just seriously, how? I can't imagine. Yeah, that's funny. I get asked that a lot. You know, how, do you, bet. How, do you, how do you do that? I wish there was some secret, like, formula that I could share. <laughs> it's kind of like you just do it, you know? Right. Um, you know, what, what other alternatives? I, I don't think I'm going to take care of my kids today. You yes, know? <laughs> right. Put them in the room, throw water and food on the ground, and then just clean up later. Yeah, they're fine. They're animals. No, <laughs> um, no my kids are awesome. I love them. And I will say, you know, it, it has been a challenge. It wasn't always easy. It wasn't all, you know, roses and rainbows, definitely. But it, it's funny how when you really want to do something, mm -hmm. how you can build your life around that. Yeah. And that's really what I did. So knowing that there are seasons of your life, especially with parenthood, you know, you go through that, that season where they're younger and it's just really, it, it is tough to get things done when they're like that. I, I like telling the story about my daughter, like she'd always climb in the back of my chair, you know, and, and just, I, the whole time I'm like rocking cause she's pushing on the chair and, yes. you know, drawing on my desk with her crayons and, you know, hollering when I'm on the phone with people and, yeah. you know, that's, that's a special time, but yeah. you know, eventually they grow past that and then you're able to, you know, focus more in on you know, the work and, and things like that. But I tell you one thing it does do is it makes you way more efficient. You know, when you know you've got Little nap windows. time is for, yeah, that's for an hour. You better get everything you can done in that hour. You better make sure you're doing something important at that time. Ah, focus is good. Yeah. Yeah. Focus is good. Well, let's, let's put some fence posts around this because it sounds really cool to say flip a thousand homes and raise five kids. So let's do the kids first. How old is the oldest and the youngest? You're going to love this. The oldest is 28. Okay. The youngest is eight. Oh, huh. okay. So, and then, <laughs> okay. So when did you start? Uh, when was your first flip? And then I'm guessing your last flip was sometime this year. So when did you start? Started in 2003. Oh, so just about the same time we did. Okay. So almost yeah. 20 years, roughly just round. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, so close 17. to 20 years in the business. Yeah. 17, I, if you want to be technical. <laughs> yeah, I say 20 at this point. Once you're past 16, it's just rounding to 20. It's just uh, 20 years. So, okay, so you, you um, so when you were flipping your first home, you obviously had at least one. Um, was, so how many did you have when you started? Sorry, I'm just so, trying to tie it together. Yeah, so when when I started, there were three. Okay, so you start with three. Mm -hmm. um, and then and when's the, I'm trying to figure out the timeline. So you have three in 2003. When does four and five come? Four and five, four came in 2008, which was a special time also, oh, yeah. as we all know. Absolutely. <laughs> and then uh, the last one was 2011. All right. And then you're flipping homes. Uh, were they all in a G like, were they all in Texas, San Antonio or were they? Mm -hmm. are you not, okay. So yeah, I've, I've always focused one market. That's my jam. I know this market so well and yeah. I'm not interested in going to other markets. I like it here. Yeah, I know why, it. why would you at this point? I mean, yeah, yeah. what's the point? <laughs> I feel the same way. It's, it's funny that you bring that up in about 08. It's just, this is going to be a fun conversation because we both started at the same time. We both saw the run up, the crash, the return. This is going to be fun. Um, so in 08, right before the crash happened in my market, which is Fresno, California, uh, I had a choice. We, we were doing 1031 exchanges because housing was just crazy price. So I could have, we actually flew to San Antonio. Um, we, did, we did like Dallas and Austin and Nevada, and, but we spent the most time in San Antonio. And I remember the beauty marks on some of your homes. That, that, was, that was what the agent called them. I call them cracks. He called them beauty marks. I thought that was interesting <laughs> marketing. That's what he called them. I was like, that's creative. Um, but um, yeah, we, did, we just did 1031s and we went to apartments instead of going to Texas and, and, it, and it worked out. 
but San Antonio has a lot going for it. Um, tell me about the, the crash. Cause I like, did you see like a 20% adjustment, 50%? What was the adjustment peak 08 single family homes to kind of the bottom 2010, 11. Do you remember the kind of spread? Oh, you know, I've slept since then and had a couple of <laughs> kids. So it's kind of rough. Yeah. Um, but there what was I a do drop, remember, right? Oh, for sure. But what, what the thing I remember the most about that time mm -hmm. is um, really learning how to pivot with exit strategies. Ah. So up until that time, um, we were buying a lot of, we were primarily rehabbing, but we were also buying a lot of um, properties to fix up and sell with owner financing. So oh, we were building okay. a note portfolio also. Interesting. Okay. Uh, creating notes and, um, and buying some rental properties and things like that. And I remember us buying a lot of properties uh, like from REO mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah. realtors and stuff like that. It was, that was the big thing back then, right? Like cultivating those relationships and having getting pocket listings oh, and all yeah. that kind of yeah. stuff. That was I like remember. a thing. So what we were doing um, was we would have a mixture of those exit strategies. So it was, we were really either rehabbing, which mm -hmm. I call just flipping. Yep. And then um, maybe a couple of wholesale deals here and there, but it wasn't a thing like it is now. Oh no, it was not a thing. Yeah. Nobody talked about it. No, I'm sure people were doing it, but it wasn't like a thing. Like we weren't assigning contracts and stuff <laughs> like we do now, <clears throat> but we did like close on some and turn around and sell them and didn't do Yeah. You close on a good deal and somebody wants one for 20 grand. You take the quick 20. I mean, it's right. It's a yeah. Thing, so right? we did a few of those. Yeah. Um, but creating those notes and then doing those flips and, and working with agents and yeah. we've always done our own marketing. So we were always marketing to sellers anyway. Yeah. But what was so great about that time was we would create these notes and then we would sell them. Ah. And it was a great time for that. I mean, we would get like, you know, we were getting like 90, 92%, yeah. you know, yeah. on those notes. Yeah. So just so in case folks don't understand what she's doing, let's just do simple math. You sell a house, hundred K, I don't know, five K down, whatever it is. The notes, 95 grand. It has an interest rate, a term that borrower has a credit rating, all of that stuff. There are people that buy notes and then you as the owner of the note can sell it at a discount. What she's saying is she gets 92% of face value now versus, you know, years down the line. So uh, yeah, that's, that's a pretty, for a thir I'm guessing most of it was 30 year paper or was it, Five year arms or 30, what were yeah 30. wow ninety two yeah we did, we typically set it up on a thirty that's that's what that that really reduces your refi risk so that meant that's what I would have assumed yeah yeah we had a oh. note buyer that we were regularly selling notes to at that time also wow but you know then the crash happened <laughs> and then we had like all these properties and nobody could qualify for a bank loan I remember. And then I had my daughter and I just, I remember that Christmas of 2008 because she was born in June. Okay. And that by the end of the year, you were really starting to see. I know, remember things. vividly. Yeah. And I just remember, you know, sitting there and going, are we going to be able to buy Christmas presents <laughs> for the kids this year? And now I got yeah. this baby and just, wow. you know, having that stress in the back of my mind and then like properties that we couldn't unload. Yeah. You know, nobody was buying notes anymore. Nobody was buying, you know, conventional or FHA or anything like that. The saving grace though, was, um, <clears throat> being able to pivot with the exit strategy of just, um, we, we did create notes, but then we were started doing more wraps. So ah, we were wrapping the notes just okay. to move the property, yeah. you know, and holding the notes. And that was actually a great time for us as far as building up our, our note portfolio. It, so it, it didn't leave a lot of cash for us, yeah. which was hard, but right. it set us up for success down the road when those notes paid off. So we were doing like short-term wraps. So sure. buy the property, finance that for five years, turn around, sell it on a 30 year. Yep. Very cool. Wow. So I want to go back to the beginning just because I got so enamored with the 08 crisis just because we both experienced that pain. So go back to 03. How does this journey start for you? Did you do you just jump in full time? Uh, do you and your husband go, you know, we have full time jobs, we're going to do this one thing and then it becomes this bigger thing? Or how's the beginning for Melissa? Yeah, that's pretty much how it went. The second scenario. So we, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> we were working full time jobs. Um, 
and they were, it, you know, it was that whole, like, it was a stable, good mm-hmm. job, good benefits, working for the government. I mean, you don't get much better than that. <laughs> it's right. like easy work. Um, but it was boring, you know, it wasn't, yeah. it wasn't an exciting, fun thing to do. And, you know, my husband at the time, we decided, well, we're going to do this real estate thing because his father was doing it. Oh. And we were just watching him kind of go through that. And, you know, he had used to be a contractor and then he gradually started buying properties. And mm-hmm. we were just like, man, he's got the best life ever. You know, he gets to just work when he wants. He's always driving around in his RV going places. And, nice. you know, that'd be great. All right. <laughs> and I had no background in real estate at all. Um, I thought at one time, actually, when I thought about it later, I had forgotten about this small, quick point in my life where, um, cause I'm from Houston originally. And I remember thinking I, I was buying my first house and thinking it'd be cool to be a realtor. You know, they just seemed so cool to me, you know, like driving <laughs> around all day in her Lexus and like showing properties. And I'm like, that seems like fun. Yeah. But then I didn't do anything with it. It just yeah. kind of sat there. But then when that came up again, you know, but this was a whole different thing. Being a, an investor is not the same thing as being an agent. It's two oh, different mindsets. They're, yeah, they're very loosely connected. They're they're in the same ball game, I guess, but they're yeah, they're they're different. So you so do you remember the first deal? I do remember the first deal. All right, the first few deals. <laughs> let, let's share the first one. It's always fun to look at the first one. So I had the what what'd you buy it for? What'd you do to it? What was the exit? What happened? Oh man, it was just one of those deals. So I don't remember like the specific <laughs> details just because it's been so long, but it was, um, it was a really cool house in a great area and it was very like cute and everything. And so, because our mentor was a rehabber, mm-hmm. our initial, you know, we were going to be rehabbers too. We didn't know any other way at the time. You okay. know, just cool. We're going to buy rentals and rehab houses. There you and go. so that was initially supposed to be the exit strategy. And I don't remember all what happened, but basically what it was, was we, we were trying to buy the property. It was half burned. Oh <laughs> yeah. Heavy <That's>, lift. <laughs> yeah. Actually we did like so many burnouts our first year. That's what we start calling them burnouts, just huh. firehouses. Yeah. And this one had caught on fire and the people um, got one of our crappy postcards that we had sent them. It had like, clouds and like dollar signs falling from the <laughs> sky or something. It was real bad, <laughs> but it, it worked. Yeah, clearly. So she called us up. We go over there. We get, we get under contract. Well, then it turns out that there's an issue, I think with the deed or something like that. So okay. um, the way it all shook out at the end was we ended up flipping a piece of paper huh. to an attorney Got it. And we got the check for that. So we didn't even touch the property. And there was a whole bunch of issues. Like the people had gotten the insurance money and they didn't fix the house. They bought another house and uh. they, documents were lost and not filed properly. And there's just like all the things. Just a mess. Yeah. It was a mess. So we flipped a piece of paper in the end. Okay. And I distinctly remember getting that check from the title company at closing. Cause that's when they still gave you yep. the checks. They didn't wire. And I looked at that thing and I was like, man, this is my whole year. What I take home and this one freaking check for a piece of paper. And it just blew my mind. And wow. after that, I was, you were hooked. I was hooked. Wow. I was hooked. <laughs> All right. So some is good. More is better. I, I'm always curious, right? To flip a thousand homes. That's that. I mean, just rough math, 20 years times 50, that's a thousand. I mean, I, how soon were you doing 50 homes a year? I mean, that's, that's, a it took a long thing. time to get to that. I would think so. I would hope so. (laughs) That didn't, that was not a fast process. It was very slow, but what turned that around, what made it possible was, was building a team. There we go. You know, was realizing, you know, there came a point where, you know, if we want to grow this thing, we can't Mm -hmm. do this on our own. It's just not scalable the way it was. And it was fine for a long time. And that's the other thing I do want to say, like with the whole raising of five kids, we made that business fit our life. You know, so we could have done a lot more deals, I'm sure at that time of life, but being so wrapped up in in raising a family and and doing all that. And, you know, we, we, we just did what we needed to do. You know, we didn't do any more than that, but then, you know, they got older and we had other projects that we wanted to take on and start other businesses. And so Mm -hmm. that was really a turning point is just hiring and growing a team. Yeah. I'm always curious, you know, your journey is impressive. Most people can't fathom doing 50 homes a year, 
when did you get to 12? Because that seems to be what most people think is possible, right? The kind of one a month. You know, it's never works out that evenly. But how soon did you go from that first flipping of paper to where you did 12 in a year? Was it year three, year four? I would say probably about year two to three. Okay. Because what happened was we were still working at our jobs. Yep, of course. Um, part, uh, full time and then doing real estate part time. So we were doing deals already while we were still working. Mm -hmm. But then um, my husband ended up getting laid off. Okay. And so that, you know, you know, he's like, I'm just, we'll just do this full time. Exactly. You know? <laughs> and I was scared, you know, and I, I was actually still working for a few months. And so I just remember just like hating him so much that, <laughs> you know, like you're out there just doing whatever and I'm still in the cubicle and I was just jealous, you know? Yeah. Envious. But, yes, um, yes. Yeah. But after a few months, you know, I finally said, you know what, forget it. Like, yeah. This isn't fair. I'm, I want to do it too. Nice. <laughs> and so that, that helped. <laughs> Very cool. I'm always curious, you know, couples that are in this, right? Cause you're, you, you know, when you're both working a full-time job, you have that little eight hour window where you're not together. Right. And then you, you know, but now you're together all the time, or at least most of the time. Um, how, how are the working relationships? Is, is there like a husband and wife team and then there's a business owner team? It's just the same people, different relationships, or how do you divide the labor? How do, how do you keep everyone happy all the time? That's just, that's a lot of togetherness. Yeah. Well, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> Fair so I should probably, <laughs> maybe this isn't the best time to mention the fact that I'm not married anymore. <laughs> oh, that's okay. So, I mean, stress happens. So that happened, you know, but, um, but during that time, it, you know, it, we, we did work as a team, you mm -hmm. know, for a lot of time and it is hard. And that, that's one thing that I do tell people about working together as a couple yeah. It is not easy. Exactly. Like it is, it is not easy at all. Um, you have to be able to separate the business and the personal, which mm -hmm. can be really difficult sometimes because exactly. it, it's so tempting, you know, to just talk about work all the time. Exactly. And you, and it's fun at first, like, and it was really great for a long time because we were just like, yeah, we're doing this and we're doing this. And, but then after a while it, it, can be if there's not clear boundaries of of the work and the home life exactly. that becomes a problem clear boundaries with that but also clear boundaries with roles like who's doing what because what we found later exactly. you know we would start to step on each other's toes a little bit and um we were never really clear about who was going to do what yeah. and so i think if you can get that clarity if you're working together with a spouse the sooner the better <laughs> oh that, yeah communication is key and and um yeah the separation is the thing that i don't think enough people appreciate right and not separation meaning relationship wise but separating work from home life right because right you're mm -hmm. in a relationship you're having kids together that's family time and if you allow work even though it's fun and it's flexible into the family time for too long uh i've not seen that work out well most of the yeah. time it, it's a very conscious choice. I think that you have to take to be present, you know, like just because you're there in the room, just because yeah. you're present in the room doesn't yeah. mean you're being present there physically. The is not, yeah. It's not the same thing. <laughs> it's definitely not the same thing. So very cool. So um, I guess I'll ask, you know, so it sounds like this is now your thing, or at least what we're, we're talking about, right. The separation or whatever you want to call that divorce, separation, whatever. Um, did you see, how has that been? you know, kind of taking on sole responsibility now and, and, and all of that. It's been great. It's <laughs> awesome. I love it. It's, I love it. I'm bossy. Awesome. Now I get to be the boss. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, <clears throat> it was actually pretty easy because um, we had started another business in 2014. Okay. And, you know, we had both started the house flipping together from day one Yep. and ran it together until 2014. And then we started this other company and we made the decision to <clears throat> have him run the new company. Cause that was his thing. It's software yeah. and, and I'm not a software person, so that's okay. not my jam at all. Um, so we decided, you know, you'll run that and I'll just continue, you know, keeping the house flipping. But Got that's it. when I knew because it had been he and I all that time, I was right. like, there's no way I can do all this alone. Just me. Yep. And that's when I, I hired a team and we had hired already, he had hired one guy before he went full-time just to focusing on the software. So he had hired one person okay. and 
I kind of inherited him right. and then built the rest of the team out after that. And that's really what helped me, you know, take it a little bit further. Yeah. So let's talk about the importance of building a team because every, lots of people talk about it. Lots of people think, I think a lot of people build a team too early, right? You don't need a team if you got zero, right? I mean, you know, that's, there is a right time to do it. Um, but it sounds like a team was really an inflection point for your business to take it to the next level. Uh, so, so where, you know, what was the, what was the most important role for you? What were some keys to that? Um, give some advice there. Yeah. So, um, you know, with that, what I, what I always tell people and what I did, you know, too, is just to know, first of all, know where your strengths and weaknesses are. Mm. And that's important just to be self-aware to know, like, what am I good at? What am I not good at? And then figuring out, okay, what are all the things that I'm doing? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, dumping all that out. And I remember dumping all that out. It's like, what am I doing? And like every little thing, it doesn't matter how big or small you think it is, you know, yeah. write it down. And then um, I like to separate those things, you know? So now it's like, okay, here are the things that I'm doing. Here's what I'm good at. Here's what I'm not good at. Let me take all those things that I'm doing that I'm not that good at. And that's going to be the first thing I take off my plate. There you go. And then you just sort of rank those things. And then you begin to slowly delegate things and hire out for those positions. But for me, hiring out the biggest pain point from the beginning was mm -hmm. like the best thing. And yeah. every hire after that took more and more and more off my plate until like the last thing, the thing that I, I liked to do. So I liked project management. I loved mm -hmm. going into the rehabs and planning the job and, mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. So that was really the last thing I took off my plate. And um, I'm but always curious, what was I the one thing, what was the first thing you were excited to get rid of? What was the one thing you hated doing? Sales. <laughs> <laughs> I, not good this at position. Sales. Yeah, okay. I'm not good at that. Well, yeah. Well, okay. the making, doing this, the, the acquisitions part of it. Oh, the acquisitions. The dispositions the I didn't have a problem with. I was actually pretty good at dispo. So the other side, so the bu the buying of the properties. Yeah. Buying. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. And, and I know that about myself. I know I'm great at building rapport. I am not great at closing the deal though. Yeah. You know, yeah. if I go in with the, like a referral or something, I can close those pretty easily, but you know, yeah. pushing is not my style and that's yeah. hard for me. So very cool. <laughs> Again. Yeah. Find out. Yeah. List everything out. Find out what you, you know, that you don't like and hire for that. And that was, a, that's a game changer, right? Fire. Oh, yeah. Cause not only does it help your business do more, but you're less stressed. That's what people don't realize about a team. Yes. There's a monetary impact, but your quality of life, Melissa's quality of life got instantly better. Right. When you, when you found right. the right person. Right. So, right. And that was the one thing that we deferred with, with our mentor, because he had always told us, you know, don't hire people, don't hire people, you know, cause he ran his whole business and something. He was, he's super successful guy. You know, he's got like, I don't know how many notes he's got and rentals and things like that. He's been doing it for a really long time. He's real under the radar, Yeah. but you know, he always told us don't hire anybody. And that was the one point where I'm like, no, I need to hire people. I don't yeah. want to do all this stuff. I see you answering your phone all the time and having all these headaches and stuff. <laughs> I don't want that. <laughs> yeah, I don't want. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, not for me. Not for me. Mm, very, very, very. I got, enough, I got enough to deal with at home besides that. <laughs> so what? So what does Melissa's business look like today in in 2020? So it looks very different now. I think 2020 changed a lot of things for a lot of people. Amen. Yeah. Um what happened was, is, you know, I spent a lot of time, like a lot of people during COVID just in self-reflection and, mm -hmm. you know, what am I doing? And do I like this anymore? Cause I was kind of getting to this point where kind of a burnout point. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. You know, it's like, yeah, I've been doing this for so long and it's not that exciting anymore. And it's yeah. the same old stuff. And <clears throat> oh, look, a new kitchen. Oh, look, the walls are painted. Oh, look. <laughs> I know. And I have a thing. So like, I am a huge systems and process person. I mm -hmm. love them. I love, like, I don't like creating it, but <laughs> I love having them. And I love like how that, what that has done for the business. Mm -hmm. So when you've got those good systems and processes in place, then things can kind of run without you having to, you know, be so involved in it. Mm -hmm. And so things were going, but then I realized, you know, I'm not, this isn't really my passion. Mm. Okay. And what I started finding was that talking to people about their business was getting me more excited. Ah. You know, like, what are you doing? 
what problem are you having? Let's talk about it. Let's see if we can figure something out. I'm a problem solver. I'm a creative thinker and I love that stuff. And I like helping people. Mm -hmm. And so I was taking all these phone calls with people just, you know, reaching out and and stuff. And I thought, man, if I could do this all day and be paid for this, it'd be awesome. There you go. (laughs) So I made a decision to, um, I call it, take my business down to the studs. Okay. I like that. (laughs) And just getting, I I mean, I've always, I've never been a person that had a a dream to grow that business super huge. Anyway, I would rather do less deals that are more profitable for sure versus, you know, breaking my neck, trying to do a hundred deals a year or something like you hear a lot of people do, Yeah, Yeah. you know, and it's like, why am I going to do all that work and make $2,000? Like I would rather do five deals and make, you know, 50 grand on those, you know, each one of those versus the other way. So I really took the time to figure out, um, you know, what do I want to do and do I still want to do this? And I knew I didn't want to turn that off completely, but I got very selective with what I'm doing with that business now. Okay. So I really stripped it down to just, you know, two marketing channels that we're doing, Mm -hmm. um, working referrals, working follow-ups that are already in the system. Sure. And just focusing on that on the back burner and focusing more on working with people, coaching them, doing one-on-one sort of things, building strategy with Mm -hmm. people. And that's more of where I'm at right now. So I'm not out of flipping, Yeah, but the strategy has changed there too. That's very cool. So one of the things I know that you do now, again, giving back, which is what you're doing a lot of, is you write for Forbes, right? The Forbes Real Estate Council, I think is what they call it. And mm-hmm. you had an article about the importance of finding a mentor, mm-hmm. uh, which I wanted to talk about because um, I think there's a lot of tremendous mentors out there that are really good at helping. But I also know that there's anytime there's money involved, that there's a lot of, I don't know, sharks, snake oil salesmen, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so I wanted to talk about that article, sort of get your thoughts and, and really talk about the importance of finding a, a mentor. Yeah, I think finding a mentor is... Um... I need to cough. So I'm just going to do that real quick. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry about that. Okay. I think finding a mentor is, um, like that is that, that was a game changer for us. I think, I I don't think we could have gotten as far as we did as quickly without having a mentor. Mm. So there's a lot to that, you know, finding, seeking out people who are good at what you want to do. Mm-hmm. Um, cause there's a lot of different mentors out there and you know, with that, it really has to be somebody that you can, you connect with, Agreed. you know, so one mentor isn't going to be right for somebody else and that's okay. You know, you need to find who you resonate with, like Absolutely. who's speaking, who's speaking your language, you know? And so I think that was a big thing, just having that mentor and a good one, you know, there's a couple of things with a good mentor like or coach you know, they're not going to tell you exactly what to do. They're going to ask you the right questions Mm -hmm. to help you figure out the answers to help you grow, you know, personally and professionally. Mm -hmm. And, you know, really they're just a sounding board for you. So you don't want to ever have a mentor where you're just going to them with every single problem. Mm -hmm. You need to have thought that problem out ahead of time before you go to that person and say, I'm having this issue this is what I think I need to do. What are your thoughts on it? You know, don't just come to them, like solve the problem for me. And you don't want them to solve the problem for you. (laughs) Yeah. Here's a present. Now unwrap it. Tell me what to do. Yeah. Yeah. Because you know, it's like you didn't do the work in order to, to figure that out, you know? And so that's a big thing. You know, another big thing is just like, I, I try to encourage people like, don't, don't do the, take you out to coffee, pick oh, your brain. Oh, I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yes. I'm glad you brought that up. Um. There she is. Um, are you, yeah. Are you, are you back? I freeze? Yeah, you froze for a little bit. Oh, because so, you're you're frozen too. Oh, hold yeah, on a minute. That's okay. I got you back now. Okay. So we'll see my if, internet. Connection. We'll see if Josh can edit. Could cut that out for us. 
It's okay. Yeah. So you were talking about taking us out to coffee. That's not a great strategy yeah. to find a mentor, right? So let's talk. Yeah. About so, yeah, you know, it, it's a hard thing because I understand the, the thought behind that, mm -hmm. you know, you think that you're doing something, but if you really want to um, connect with a mentor, find out what you can do for them, you know, not buy them a cup of coffee. Like we can yeah. buy our own coffee. Yeah. But, you know, like, what, what are you planning to bring to the table? Is there something that you can do for them? Can you, are you really great at something that would be helpful in that mentor's business? You know, are you great at marketing? Is there some help you could give with marketing? Yeah. You know, can you go put signs out? Can you work on a, a campaign for them? Like, actionable things, not just let me pick your brain, because yeah. that's... It just doesn't work out very well when you, when you do it that way. Yeah. I'm so glad you brought it up because, you know, I, I'd always help people while I was working, but it was always kind of intermittent, right? Cause I had to fit it in around everything else I did. So it felt mm -hmm. like, I mean, looking back on it, it might've been once a month, right. Where I would go, you know, I would just bump into people in, in quote unquote, the coffee talk. Right. But mm -hmm. once I retired, right. From the day job, I wrote the book one rental at a time. My requests sort of went like this, right. It just went exponential. And I'm like, holy shit, I can fundamentally not drink that much coffee, right? I, I fundamentally can't <laughs> say yes to everybody and that kills me, right? right? So I had to make a choice. It's funny that we brought this up. I could go the route of, you know, charging thousands of dollars an hour to meet with people, which doesn't fill my emotional cup because that's not where I came from. I was rather poor growing up. Mm -hmm. So I chose the other route was I'm not going to ever do that. I'm never going to charge anybody a thousand dollars for my time. I actually documented my entire how to learn a market, right? Buy one rental at a time. And I sell that for nearly nothing, right? It's 200 bucks, my entire process. But now what I do to, to kind of do the mentoring is I give, I give the, only my students 30 minutes every Saturday in, fa in our Facebook group to ask me questions. So that makes me feel good, right? If, if you're willing to sign up for 200 bucks to, and then do the work, I will answer all of your questions from 9 a.m. to 9.30 Saturdays. So that, that fills my cup. So, um, yeah, I, I just think when you have the opportunity to give back, you choose how to do that. And I know exactly. you're doing some amazing things with Forbes. And then you just had a challenge, the E3 challenge that was on August 31st. Let's mm -hmm. talk about what that was. And again, it's all, all, you know, you giving back, which I think is so wonderful. Yeah. And, and I think we should. And I, you know, I'm a firm believer in giving back. So that's why I always hesitate about the don't take them out for coffee thing, because it yeah. makes it seem like you don't care about people, but I totally care about people. Yeah. It's just, you also have to have a boundary too. You know, like I have oh, yeah. family and kids and I have work I need to do too. And I can't just, you know, but there are ways to give back, to give to those people that need something. And that's, I do put a lot of focus on that. So yes, one of the do. things is, um, you know, through that challenge. So I did a five free day. Wow. A five, a free five day. There we go. There you go. <laughs> challenge um, that I call the E3 challenge. So E3 for me, which I started this night, I realized it was a gaming thing, but um, I have these three pillars that I use when I coach people that I really firmly believe in. And, they, and one leads to the other leads to the other. So it's encouragement, education, and empowerment. Nice. And those three things, I think if you can master those three things, that it will help you be successful. And that's what, those are the three things that I use when I coach with people. Mm -hmm. So the, the challenge was um, change your business, change your life. And nice. so it was five days, just five quick little activities each day with a quick video that I did that um, we go through mindset, evaluating your business, you know, assessing your business. Um, creating a business plan because a lot of people, what I'm hearing is, you know, they, they don't know where to start. They don't know where to focus. And so mm -hmm. helping them create just so that even just a one page business plan, even yeah. if you just start with that can be really effective. So we walk through that and then we walk through um, a lot of, you know, some empowerment things. So, you know, once you're feeling empowered, spread that feeling, you know, how do we do that? And so yeah. with actionable items each day to do, and, and it was really Nice. I think it went really well and plan on building that. So I'm going to actually put all that together and have that up on my website so that people can, that didn't get to participate live in the challenge can still sure. go back and access that. 
That's awesome. So how can people follow you a, and then learn more about what you're offering? Cause there's a lot of people that watch this channel that, that can look at what you've done the last 20 years and go, you know, I think she could help me. I think, I think I, I and, and people are going to connect with you. you. You're very easy to you know, speak with and, and fun. So uh, how can people follow you and then where can they go check out uh, more about your coaching? Sure. So follow, um, I put a lot of content on Instagram. Okay. So that's Melissa Johnson eight, just the number eight. It's my favorite number. So ah. I, I usually have an eight somewhere everywhere on everything I do. Nice. Um, on, that's on Instagram. I'm also on LinkedIn. Um, and then I have a business Facebook page, just Melissa Johnson, REI. And then I just, uh, launched my website. So that's the Melissa And that's got uh, links to, I just launched a podcast also. Nice. Um, so I've been real busy, but the podcast links are there. So you can listen, you know, iTunes, Spotify, whatever, those are all there. Um, and just a little bit about me and the coaching and, and stuff like that. Very, very cool. Again, folks, uh, hopefully you've seen over the last half hour, she is, she's got tons of track record, tons of experience. She's, Got a lot to give there. I can still not imagine flipping a thousand homes and raising five kids. Um, she was a full-time employee. She, she researched her market. She's done it all in San Antonio. There's just so much there to like and respect. Uh, I do think you need to check out Melissa Johnson, uh, the Melissa Johnson.com. Um, thank you very much for your time today. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Of course.